to share with you this morning a story that rocked my life when I read it and understood it. If you can get the lessons from this obscure little story in the Old Testament, it will stand like a rock inside of you and in your faith. Okay, it's an obscure little story back in 2 Samuel. It occurred just after King David took over as king. Uh, king Saul had been killed along with his son and David had just taken over the throne. Now, uh, I don't have a lot of time and there is so much in here. I might need to speak a couple of weeks or a few weeks on this because there's so much in this. But this story is still churning around inside of me right now. It is helping me to walk as a Christian. And I've titled this sermon, Sitting Crippled at the King's Table. This is a story about a crippled man who was brought to King David's table. I'm just going to read through it and then we'll make some comments on it. I just want to pray. Father, thank you for your word. Your word is like the fuel in our engine. It is life. And your spirit is the spark that ignites that fuel. We take this fuel and we ask, Spirit of God, would you be the spark to this fuel so that our engine can move forward with you? We just invite you to speak to our hearts now through your word. Thank you. Thank you for your spirit. Amen. Second Samuel chapter 9. And we're going to read the whole chapter. It's not that long, and it's a great story. A lot of you have probably read it, but I want you to capture the application for us Christians in it. Because there's a really good parallel between being this story and us Christians. Then David said, Is there yet anyone left of the house of Saul that I might show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and they called him to David. And King David said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. And the king said, Is there not yet anyone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, Well, there's still a son of Jonathan who is crippled in both feet. So the king said to him, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, behold, he is in the house of Micah and the son of Amiel in Lodabar. And King David sent and brought him to the house, from the house of Micah and the son of Amiel to, uh, from Lodabar. Mephibosheth, that's a mouthful, you can say wheelbarrow if you need to. Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and prostrated himself. David said, Mephibosheth. And he said, here is your servant. David said to him, do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness to you for your sake, for the sake of your father Jonathan, and will restore to you all the land of your grandfather Saul, And you shall eat at my table regularly. Oh, there's some good stuff in this. I don't know. I just want to launch out right there. I better keep going. Again, he prostrated himself and said to him, and this is something I've said to God a lot of times, what is your servant that you should regard a dead dog like me? How many times have you said that to God? Then, king, then the king called Saul's servant Ziba and said to him, All that belongs to Saul and all of his house I have given to your master's grandson. Now you and your sons and your servants shall cultivate the land for him and you will bring in the produce so that your master's grandson may have food. Nevertheless, Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall eat at my table regularly. Whew. Now, Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. 
Then Ziba said to the king, according to all that my lord, the king commands his servant, so shall your servant will do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table as one of the king's sons. Do you get it? Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah and all who lived in the house of Ziba were the servants of Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem for he ate at the king's table regularly. Now he was lame in both feet. Wow. <clears throat> I'd love to unpack this, but we might be here for a few days. That story, when I started to see the similarities to my life, being brought to God's table and being given that honour, it undid me. And, and I need to give you a bit of background to give you context in this. What was David saying? He, in the very first verse he said, Is there anyone yet left of the house of Saul, Saul that I might show kindness for Jonathan's sake? That word kindness is the Hebrew word hasid. And it is one of the most powerful words in the Old Testament. The psalmists have translated that word, and it's pretty good, as loving kindness. The loving kindness of God. It's favoritism that you're getting because of the goodness of another person. And the kindness of this other person's heart. Not because you deserved it. You're getting kindness. You're getting favoritism. You're getting love because of something that took place in the heart of the giver. Now what, now what was that? In our Western world right now, we are so shallow in, when it comes to contracts. You sign a contract, but there's always a get out clause. And you can terminate a contract at any time. There's always little clauses in there to say you can get out of it. But when these guys in the ancient times made a covenant, they would rather die than break that covenant. Now, if you've never heard how they did it, it was pretty, it was pretty powerful. Can, can I use you, Pete, as, as, as an illustration? Would you, would you mind just coming here and standing with me? So if Peter's tribe and my tribe wanted to make a covenant, we would go through a ceremony. He would take his armor and he would put it on me. I would take my armor and I would put it on him, which signified all of the strength of his protection was now for me and for my family. And all of the strength of protection from me and my family is now for his family. He would then take his weapon belt, he would exchange that and put it on me, and I would do the same to him, which meant my hand of force was available for his family's protection, and vice versa, that his family would come to my rescue. They would also take his cloak, his robe, and he would take that robe off and he would put it on my shoulders. And I would take my robe off and I would put it on his shoulders. And as the heads of our families, that represented the authority that I carry is now yours. You can speak on my behalf, I trust you, and I can speak on your behalf because you trust me. And then they would do one final thing. After all of these symbolic exchanges, and I was going to bring a knife, but I thought it might scare you a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but they would take the right hand and they would slice into his right hand and slice into my right hand. And as the blood started to drip yes they would probably do more like that but i'm, I'm just going to do this because in the west we do this a lot we shake hands but that is a covenant symbol that says i am in agreement with you 
and the blood that runs through your family and the blood that runs through my family has now been mixed to death. And we are in covenant together because of that powerful ceremony. Thank you. Good example. Give him a hand. You're glad I didn't bring the knife? I've got a fishing knife. We could have have made a mess. You see, this is what David had done with Jonathan. Now, I don't know whether to say this or not, but... I am ashamed of those people who have said, look, there is homosexuality in the Old Testament. See, David and, Lo- and Jonathan loved each other. Please shut your unbelieving mouth. You have no idea what that, those two men did. Do you know why David and Jonathan did that? It was because when Jonathan was still alive, he did stuff like David did. There was one time where Jonathan and his servant went up and attacked the Philistines just single-handedly. And that was the passion in Jonathan's heart. Jonathan loved God and believed God. And David recognized that in Jonathan's life and said, I like this guy. He's after the heartbeat that I have. I will make covenant with him. And so even though his father Saul was constantly throwing spears at David to do him in, the son of Saul was the opposite. Yes, amen loved God and loved David and loved with with the sort of love that David understood and so here we are in chapter 9 Saul has been killed and Jonathan has been killed and David has been made king and David is saying which is very opposite to what all kings whenever someone would succeed another king they would kill all the members of that previous king's family to make sure that none of their heirs could come back and take the throne back. That was the way they did it. So you could imagine when David is saying, is there anyone left of the house of Saul that I might show Hasid for Jonathan's sake? A lot of people are thinking, uh... <laughs> maybe (laughs) and of course there was but people who were around David understood the way that he did things and that he wasn't the same as everyone else because he used that word Hasid he said even though my covenant partner is no longer alive yet loving kindness still beats in my heart And I have to do something with it. I have to express this covenant love somehow. Is there anyone left that I can, for the sake of Jonathan, show him through his family this love? And of course there was. I thought it was interesting that Ziba says, well, yeah, there is, but he's crippled. You see, if you had any defect in those days, you were not allowed in the king's presence. Whenever royalty would march through the streets, there would be people who would go ahead of those trains of, of, of dignitaries and would clear out anyone with any deformities, any blind people, any lame people, anything. Because the king was not to look upon flawed people. Well, our God is the same. He cannot have sin in his presence. And so the chances of Mephibosheth ever getting an audience with David were less than zero. (coughs) But here David was saying, Ziba, go and get him. I don't care if he's cruel. (coughs) And notice that David sent and got Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth didn't come to David. Jesus was sent to rescue us, to bring us to the (coughs) Father. We couldn't get to the Father because of the sin and the crippledness in our lives. But he sent his son 
to bring us to him. So here we are. He's been <coughs> brought before David. And I reckon that Mephibosheth would be packing it right now. I mean, absolutely terrified. I'm in trouble. Oh, for sure I'm going to die. So they carry Mephibosheth in. Now, you know how he got broken uh, lame? When he was four years old, the historians believe. When <coughs> Saul was killed... Oh, well, when the battle was going on between Saul and, uh, and David and the kingdom was getting split, Mephibosheth and the people that were caring for him had such, an un, a, a, such a wrong attitude of who David was. They thought David was bad news because that's what they'd been told by, by Saul. And so when the nurses picked up Mephibosheth to run, to escape from what they thought was certain doom for that family, they dropped Mephibosheth and broke both of his ankles. And in those days, there was no radiology department or being able to sort it out. So he grew up not only with broken ankles, but he grew up with a lie inside of him. ruin your life you take all the fun out of it so you always kept yourself a little bit at a distance yeah I'm cooking down here Thanks. <laughs> interesting how the stuff that we get from our childhood stays with us and influences us until God finally conquers that lie or those lies so I, I want you to picture with me Mephibosheth, standing before David. He is in the house of David. He's sitting at the table. And around the table, very large table, there are generals. There are commanders. There's Joab. There's David's sons. There's all sorts of dignitaries. And here's Mephibosheth sitting at the table. What do you think he's thinking to himself? Well, he'd gone through that. He'd gone through all of the, oh, I'm in trouble. And he finally realized that he was safe. And every night he would be brought into the king's table to eat dinner with the sons and the generals and everyone else. And he's sitting there and he's thinking, what, what did I do to deserve this? What, what can I do to deserve this? If, uh, <laughs> And, and this is how absurd it is. But we do this as Christians. Could you imagine Mephibosheth dragging himself around the side of the table and saying to David, oh, you want the salt? Do you, want, do you need a napkin? Can I, can I get you a drink? Can I fill your glass? How absurd is that? Yet we do that with God. We try and earn a gift that is so beyond our earning because it doesn't make sense to be brought as a cripple to the king's table and be given a place among his sons. How, how can that be? It's too great to hold on to. You have to earn it, you have to do something. <clears throat> but I'm imagining, and this is just in my mind's eye, that one night as Mephibosheth is eating again for the umpteenth time dinner, surrounded by all these people. And there's David at the end of the table, 
And he's just watching David eating his food. And David takes a bit of bread and he dips the bread in something. And as he lifts it up to his hand, to his mouth, Mephibosheth notices a scar on David's hand. And he thought, hang on, I've seen that scar before. My dad, that's right. My dad had that same scar. And I think that's when the penny dropped for him. He realized that his dad and and David had made covenant. And that the reason he was at that table wasn't because of what he did, but was because of what David did. What his dad did, his father. Now we have someone in heaven who has a scar on both his hands. And the only reason that we can sit crippled as we are with all our flaws and all our failures and all our faults. And the only reason we can sit there is because of the scars in those hands. Is there anything that we can do to earn our place at that table? Nothing. It's absurd to even consider trying to pay God back. Oh God, look, I, I can help you. What if I, what if I do the Sunday school for you? What, uh, what if I uh, help in this area in the church? What, what if I give some money? Do you realize what an insult that is to try and earn a gift that great? But hang on. Hang on. There is something. There is something that you can do. And I thought about this. You remember when Mephibosheth said, Who am I that you should regard such a dead dog like me? Do you know what David said to him about that? If you look in it, he never responded to it. David did not respond to the dead dog mentality. But there was one thing that Mephibosheth could do to honor David for what he'd given him. And that was this, to let go of his dead dog mentality and take up his new identity as one of the king's sons. To think like a son, to act like a son, to walk like a son, to have a son's <clears throat> kingdom thoughts and priorities, and to work towards the honor of the kingdom that you've now been placed in. Now, what has this got to do with us? Well, there's a lot. Because just like you, I've been fighting with this dead dog mentality from my past. Of who I was, the family I came from, the lies that was planted in me when I was young. And they constantly fight inside of my spirit as God's word said, you're a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. But then I'm fighting with attitudes and, and, and hurts and, and bitternesses from the past. Where God is saying, let them go. Walk in a new life. Walk in a new identity. But these things still affect me. And I realize I've got to keep fighting against my old identity... And I have to keep reaching forward to my new sonship. Yes. Of who I have been made in Christ. Yes, amen. And it's not something that happens once and it's done. I've been trying to do it for 40 years and I'm making progress. But I haven't made it. I thought after maybe 20 years I would have gotten most of the way there. 
but after 40 years, I still haven't. And I, there are times when I've become so discouraged when I say, God, I don't know why you keep persisting with me. Surely you've got to run out of patience with people like me. And you know what he says? Keep coming, son. Keep coming. You're being transformed by the renewing of your mind. All things have passed away. Behold, all things are becoming new. Now we now walk with the Lord and I don't have much time to pull out much more out of that but you can see if you spend a bit of time and read through that chapter through that story there's a lot in it we have been brought to the king's table we're about to gather around it yes do you deserve to be there no is it a gift yes can you pay him for it no can you honour him for it? Yes. The best thing you can do is to stop letting the past talk to you about your future, about where you should go and what you should do and who you should walk with. Because Jesus has made all things new for us. And it doesn't stop when you become a Christian. Um, anyone think that there have been any people arrive at the end of their life completely sorted out? Can you think of anyone? No sin. They've made it. They've been so renewed that there's no sin at all. They made it. They sorted it out. So that means every single person who passes into eternity is going to go in flawed until that final transformation I think it's true I think we in some ways we remain crippled up to the very day when we step into eternity and the final frontier of sin and of being a broken vessel is only healed when we step over into eternity so what does that mean do you after 40 years of trying you give up you keep going and no matter how many times you fall over you keep going because he is the only one worthy and you never quit father thank you for your word thank you for the lessons in your word right now we we lay down our past we lay down the failures that we've made and and are still making and we say, God, keep rescuing us. Keep changing us. Keep transforming us. We want to walk as your sons and your daughters. And your kingdom is the only thing that matters to us. Thank you for your word, which counsels us. And thank you for your spirit that carries us. If you agree, say amen. Amen.